Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's Recovery Summit presented by St. Clair County Community Mental Health with support from the St. Clair County Health Department. Today's presentation is on MORT, the Mobile Overdose Response Team. Um, before we begin, we'd like to go over some general reminders. Please use the chat feature for all questions or comments. Our presenter will be answering questions as time allows. Today's presentation offers one Social Work CE and one McBab credit. If you are requesting professional credits, you must remain on the webinar the entire time for credit. If you lose connection, please reconnect as soon as you're able. A survey will pop up following the conclusion of the webinar. Those of you that are requesting Social Work CEs, a completion of the survey is necessary. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter. Ken Huvelman is a limited licensed professional counselor, certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, and certified clinical supervisor. He works as the clinical coordinator for Port Huron Odyssey House. He has been working in the behavioral health field for over 10 years, including outpatient SUD services and inpatient psychiatric care. He has a master's in psychology from Montana State University Billings and a master's in clinical mental health counseling from Walden University. In the community, Mr. Huvelman works as an ad advocate for the expansion of access to behavioral health treatment and for innovative approaches to reduce the community impact of opioid overdose. Ken is also the chair of the St. Clair County Substance Use Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery Work Group and is a member of the St. Clair County Health Department's Advisory Board. Welcome, Ken. Thank you for the introduction. And each edit, it seems to get a little bit longer. I've got to work on that. So I'm doing too much, I suppose. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, to learn more about our mobile overdose response team. Um, so it is named MORT for those that are uh, second language speakers. Uh, yes, MORT does mean death in Latin, uh, I believe also in French and maybe Spanish. Um, it is kind of a dark sense of humor that I possess when we did pick this name one acronyms are helpful. Uh, and it is also that we would hope the MORT team uh, and the MORT folks are coming and not death. Um, so as we move into this presentation, again, any questions, go ahead, throw them into the chat, um, and I'll work to answer those with the best of my ability uh, at the end. Um, so MORT is a follow-up program uh, here through community partnerships. This was something that really began as discussions as early as 2016, 2017, um, before we were able to find a funding revenue source through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, through the Center for Disease uh, Disease Control. Um, so this is a partnership program that does not function with just addiction professionals, does not function with just first responders. It creates this cooperative uh, approach to changing really the delivery of service. Um, and it is focused on the opioid crisis, um, as I'll talk about further where it may be targeted for those who are primarily opioid use disorder, uh, it really is, we are touching uh, and coming into contact with uh, really those with any form of substance use disorder. Uh, so again, point is that follow-up. Um, it is an evidence-based quick response team. Uh, that's our model. The goal, linkage to care. How do we get you from uh, an overdose intervention, which may be naloxone by a friend, family, maybe naloxone uh, by EMS, police, uh, stranger. Um, how do we get you from that overdose event to care? Um, and it's a very specific phrasing in that, uh, that it is linkage to care. It is not linkage to treatment. It is not linkage to 12 step. It is not linkage to anything other than care. And if you kind of keep that soft lens, um, it fits this evidence-based model. Um, through our QRT program, through MORT, uh, we were able to develop what's known as a practice profile. So we worked with some of the other quick response teams in the state of Michigan that are in this same funding. Uh, there's about nine of them currently operating across the state of Michigan through this. Um, with some of those other partners that are doing this, we were able to create a practice profile uh, and really look at some of those key parts of it. Um, yeah, we worked with uh, Western Michigan University, uh, Families Against Narcotics, uh, Home of New Vision, 
the Greater Flint Health Coalition, uh, the City of Detroit, uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Henry Ford Allegiance, uh, Oakwood Health Systems, and then even the CDC Foundation. So collectively, we all work together um, for multiple viewpoints. We had evaluation staff, we had EMS staff, uh, professional counselors, social workers. Uh, we came together to create a practice profile. And what we looked at, what makes this model work um, is some of the core beliefs that no individual is beyond help. This might be the fourth overdose they have had in two months. This might be the third year that you've met up with this same person. Um, but recognizing that true part that no individual is beyond help is a core principle of uh, MORT and quick response teams. Um, another key component of this model is the use of individuals with lived experience. Um, so having individuals who have gone through recovery, have gone through treatment, uh, perhaps who have experienced an overdose, um, having those individuals as part of this team is critical. Without it, it doesn't tend to work. Um, having that shared lived experience truly develops a different kind of interpersonal relationship um, with these individuals. These are people who just experienced an overdose. Uh, most law enforcement officers don't understand that, um, not because of choice or inability to, uh, they just don't have that, that lived experience. They don't know what that may be like um, in the feelings that can come after. If you can qualify uh, peer recovery coaches, um, if you can use a peer support specialist, if you employ those folks in this model, you have a better chance for outcome. The increased relatability, uh, the better understanding, the shared experience of, of an event is helpful. Um, for our program, our staff is individual with lived experience. Um, all three of the coaches we've had on it, myself as coordinator, uh, I am a person in long-term recovery. I am a person who has uh, two overdose reversals due to naloxone. Um, since then, I figured some stuff out, and all of those letters that come after my name came after I put my my stuff together, I believe is my uh, PG term for that. Um, so having individuals who know what that can be like to navigate use, treatment, recovery, we become a better guide. Um, it does allow for authentic empathy uh, because we can have we have placed ourselves in that hole with the person. Um, other parts of these is another understanding. So what gets lost a lot of times in these linkage to care systems, uh, sometimes often with our first responders or others that aren't as open, it's very frequent in the recovery community as well, is with this, you need to meet an individual where they are at. Um, if a person is not open, the residential treatment. They might need detox. All signs might say like, you need to stop using today and we need to get you to treatment by this tonight or it's not gonna go well. If you enter into a power struggle with that individual, there will be no change. Um, that's again, another one of those where lived experience kind of helps. Um, very often an individual with a badge um, just initiates a power struggle to begin. Uh, it initiates fear in the overdose uh, uh, individual. Um, it just doesn't function. So knowing that our goal is to meet them wherever they are. Um, and I can say through our experiences with this, we have we have knocked on a door. And within 30 minutes, we are getting that person to a treatment facility. Like, okay, you want to go? Let's get on the road. Um, we have had individuals who have slammed the door in our face and said, don't come back. Uh, we have assisted with connecting some of these folks to a syringe service program through the health department. Um, so providing them with clean works to continue using, um, providing them with naloxone because they're not ready to stop. Um, and that's been some of the ways we do it. Some of it is getting right to treatment. Some is helping them use in a safer manner. Um, having that compassionate, uh, empathetic, and open conversation with them sometimes they may continue to use for a little while but it increases the likelihood they're going to call us back they kept our card they kept our community resources they know someone out there is non-judgmental and is truly there to assist them 
Um, and we've had people call back 18 months post overdose uh, that didn't have a problem. They had just had an accident. They used the wrong substance. Something happened last year. 18 months later, somehow they still saw our business card or something. And they called us saying, okay, now I need help. That doesn't happen if you get into a power struggle. If you start to tell the client or the individual what they have to do to change their life. Uh, just having this open conversation with someone who experienced that overdose is huge. Um, it's that Rogerian model of person-centered initiatives. It's about them. If they don't want it, they don't want it. If they do, cool, how do we help you? Um, what we look at for uh, time frames, how quick do we get out to them? Uh, our program, and then the whole model is really within 24 to 72 hours. Uh, someone, I still have never found who actually called it this, but in the CDC grant, they did. So um, they called that 24 to 70 hour, 72 hour window, a uh, window for recovery. Um, so in that recovery window, the person was more likely to be open to accepting resources, but going to be more willing to seek treatment, seek assistance, seek that linkage to care if you get to them soon. Um, they're still kind of uh, in that shock, in that uh, really traumatic kind of state where, you know, what just happened has still shook them. It hasn't turned into, well, that's just a thing that happened and no harm, no foul. Um, the delivery model. And again, we're getting social work credits here. So I'm going to guess I've got a lot of clinicians here and we can use fun clinical ease. Um, which I will absolutely use in my grant applications, uh, but when training on how we actually do it, it's different. So um, when we go, we do an SBIRT. An SBIRT is a screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. Sounds technical, sounds hard, sounds like you got to do it right. Um, really, we call it a pointed conversation. Screening, how are you doing today? You know, are you feeling better after what happened Tuesday? Tuesday was rough. How are you doing? I screened them. How often did you use drugs? Is this your first time using drugs? I'm screening them. I'm asking questions that are just basic conversation. Um, a brief intervention. Did you know that drugs are bad and that using could lead to future overdose? I'm going to guess they took a DARE class, so they probably already do. But that's a brief intervention. I'm providing clinical education. I'm educating them about the risks that they are. Hey, did you know that there is a high number of uh, fentanyl pills going around that fentanyl is making its way into? Have you heard that uh, xylazine has worked its way into the current supply here in town? Um, we just want you to have that awareness. Be safe. Um, and then, of course, a referral to treatment. Um, do you want help getting somewhere? How can we help you? Um, naloxone distribution, ongoing follow up. So within our program, uh, we're going to make three or four attempts in that first couple days. Um, after we make contact, depending on how receptive and what the person wanted, we're going to continue to follow up at what feels right. Uh, three months later, six months later, we're going to be coming back to your house. We're going to be going back to your door um, and seeing how you're doing. We're just double checking, is everything all right? Um, our model that we use right now, uh, we have a partnership in place with the City of Port Huron Police Department, Yale Police Department, St. Clair Police Departments. We have one pending that we are working out with uh, the Marysville Police Department at this time. Um, we have tried in the past with Clay, uh, the Clay Algonac Ira area. Um, things got in the way that made that not doable at that time. Um, and then we look to continue to find that way to expand, uh, you know, cover the county as a whole. Um, so we primarily focus, I hate to say primarily focus, uh, the primary location of most overdoses is here in the city of Port Huron. About half of the overdoses for our community happen inside the city of Port Huron. Um, so that's where a large majority of our work goes. Um, our agreements with these police departments um, is that they uh, kind of look through the uh, police reports for overdoses. They have worked uh, within their department to add it to some of their police reports. They have a couple boxes checked that, hey, is this overdose? Was a mort card left? Do we need to follow up? So they've really integrated it into how they police. 
um, and how they respond to uh, suspected overdoses. They pulled that information and they shared it with our, our staff. At that point, we coordinate with um, Community Resource Officer Baker, um, and then also uh, Sarah Schoenberg, who is a uh, trauma therapist with uh, the CMH uh, Mobile Crisis Unit. Um, so we have a mental health staff on board. We have a community resource uh, uniformed, quasi-uniformed police officer. I think they try to hide and pretend that they don't look like officers, but even then they still look like uh, like cops. Um, but not in a full uniform, generally, you know, T-shirts, um, something still police-like, but they really are just there to make sure something doesn't happen to us. They kind of step back and let, you know, uh, Sarah as a clinician or our peer recovery coaches take the lead, letting them be the drivers of the conversation. Because again, that lived experience, shared experience, um, I don't no, because I can't see the audience. If there's a police officer or a sheriff's deputy or MSP in the audience, um, I don't mean any offense, but sometimes people who are currently using drugs don't like you um, and don't want to talk to you. Um, and given that, it's great that we've had these relationships where they just kind of stand back. They know to let the recovery professionals work. They know that if they're needed in the conversation, it doesn't mean that Officer Baker or uh, Chief Raker or someone else in St. Clair or Yale um, are unable to engage in this conversation. It's just sometimes it's not well received. Um, this is, you know, at least in my experience, dad lectures, I always heard them. I just didn't listen to them. Um, the message just I was passed. Um, so having that part um, where you have these recovery professionals going out is a huge piece of it. Um, you know, if a police department enacted this themselves, it just doesn't have that same impact. Um, so that's kind of our model here in St. Clair County, what we have. Again, it's police driven. They give us the information and then we kind of work out where we're going to go. Um, the other QR keys throughout the state, so I know like in Genesee County, it's hospital-based. Uh, I believe up in Bay, Midland, Saginaw counties, I think it's EMS-based. Um, Detroit is through its health department. Um, and then FAN, uh, FAN, which operates, I think it's like through 18 different police departments uh, in a couple different counties. And there's just more police-led um, where the police is the head of the team, but they have the re uh, recovery professionals involved. So there's some broadness to the model, but some of those basics that are in there, again, data informed decisions. Uh, it's about the interpersonal relationship, uh, partner engagement. If I don't know where to take someone to what they need to get, then I, it doesn't work. Um, having that culture of humility, team-based leadership, um, person-centered care, like those are some of the basics to it. Um, the specific how does it works uh, is kind of, you can work around it and find some ways that work for your program. Um, but from what we've seen from our model, we use the law enforcement as the supplier of the individual's names, information. So you kind of get the name, age, location of overdose, location of address, um, and then we collect from them the substance that they believe they overdosed on. And this is one of the more curious parts. Um, so if you aren't a person who has or has a history of drug use, you would think that, well, don't they know what they're using? Um, yes, but no. Um, they know what they planned to use. Um, and in today's world, most substances are pure. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more about how we have some things that don't make sense. Um, but because we collect it from on scene, if someone overdoses and the police ask me what did they use, whatever I tell them is what gets added to the report. So they're not digging into, you know, there is no CSI um, to see like, well, what did they actually use? Um, working on it, whole other program. If the health department's out there listening, I have ideas. Um, but it's it's gathered that way. So a lot of it's from police report from what was learned on scene. Why did we have this thing created? What was the point of it? Um, what we saw is this horrible number 
299 were basically three times the amount of overdoses from 2011 to 2020. We tripled in the number of people who were overdosing. That's statewide. Well, let's look at St. Clair County. How are we doing? Oh, crap. Um, okay. So in 2018, we were the seventh worst county based on the crude rate of overdose. And then we were eighth worst on overdose deaths. There is, and I'm going to get my math wrong, uh, I believe there is 93 counties in the state of Michigan. We're number seven. So that's, you know, top 5% in a category that you don't want to finish top 5% in. Um, so we have been hit harder than many other communities. Uh, last time I did math, which I still try to avoid sometimes, that's why I'm in uh, counseling. Math is not always there. Um, I just have to count the number of minutes in session versus hard math. Um, what I have seen is our rate of overdose for the city of Port Huron was about one in every 300 people. So if you took the total number of individuals who overdosed or were identified as overdosing um, and then divided that out by the total number of people in the city, we had about one in 300 people experience an overdose. That's a small number. I mean, we have 96 people in this training, so that would mean less than one, but about a third of a person. So it, it's... It's a sizable number that you can see. Um, and that was city of Port Huron. If we then looked at our Southern tip of the county, so Marine City and South, um, where it's often believed that there's not the same kind of problem because it has a more rural impact, it's just not there. Uh, that was about one in every 340 uh, if you lumped those Southern zip codes together. So we, we have an issue. Um, when I get to look at numbers, I can look at Wayne County, and if I try to compare us to Wayne, we're doing awesome. Um, Wayne County's numbers are scary. If you look at the county in Oakland, in Genesee, well, numbers are scarier. They have about the same number of deaths in Genesee County as we do as overdoses. Um, so while our problem is minor compared to others, we still have a significant issue. Um, Inside Port Huron, just in 2020, we had a 20% increase in overdoses. Um, some of you may remember there was a small medical thing that went around in 2020. I believe it was called COVID. Um, it's still here, and we get to see the commercial still. Uh, but that led to some significant changes uh, in our community and with substance use. Um, shame with plug, if you head over to the Community Services Coordinating Body Facebook page, you will see our town hall where we talked about the impact of COVID on substance use. Um, so we saw that increase, numbers went in the wrong direction and we had been pretty steady, almost going down up until then. Um, how we determined that this is a thing, like I mentioned, this was conversations back in 2017 uh, with Tri Hospital, ourselves with Port Huron Odyssey House. Um, we tried to figure out how to do something that we saw. We saw that you needed to get people at the right time. If you waited for someone to come to you for treatment, I can open my office. And if I sit there and wait for clients to show up, I'll only get a few. If I go out and find the clients and let them know that I am here and that I think you need help, you're going to get a better result. You're going to get people to where they need to get. Um, so we operated Project Assert at Lake Huron Medical Center, where we had an actual clinician or an actual peer recovery coach on site at the ER. Um, we are actively working to resume these. We right now do them uh, as an on-call basis with both hospitals. So both McLaren and Lake Huron Medical Center, if they see someone that needs SUD services, um, they can call us. Our MORT program will go in and talk to anyone in the hospital, overdose, alcohol, or otherwise. Um, but what we saw, again, especially with 2020, when people said, I'm not going to the hospital unless I am like dead, um, we identified that a lot of people didn't make it to the hospital, but still overdose. Many of them were AMA, they were signing out against medical advice uh, and choosing not to go to the hospital, or they were in the hospital so quick they were back home, you know, within six hours, and nothing happened. No follow up. Police department doesn't come back to your house post response unless there's a reason because you did it again. Um, so we saw this gap. 
Um, so what we did is we basically took our project to cert model, what we saw work there, and we added wheels. We made it mobile. Um, we created that mobile overdose response team and said, let's go to them and how do we do it? Um, so we have a need. Um, we have an issue with overdose within our community. Um, our goals of this program, pretty basic, increase death. Can we help more people live? Now, this is another one of those. If your view is to make it so no one in the community ever uses drugs again, good luck. It's not going to happen. If you don't die, you have a chance to find recovery. If you are deceased, we're done. That's it. The goal of this program is not to get everyone into a recovery pathway. The goal of this program is not everyone to get to 30 days of treatment and all better. Would we love that? Yes, it's not realistic. The goal of MORT is to decrease overdose deaths. We want less people dying. If they don't die, they have a chance to figure it out again later. Um, we want to prevent subsequent overdoses. We want to decrease the number of people whose names keep coming up on the list. You've had five. This person's had three. This person's had six in the last you know, year. How do we get these high acuity folks what they need? How do we help prevent subsequent overdoses? Where if you have an overdose, um, and this is uh, evidence-driven, the risk of death goes up exponentially each overdose you have. The large majority of people who are dying, it is generally not their first overdose. It is a subsequent. It is something that has already happened, and then it happened again. So if you can work to prevent and put something in place to help this person not have that overdose again. Um, another huge part of the MORE program, community education, that's this. Uh, that's uh, getting out and educating uh, the library. We trained all library staff uh, in St. Clair County on how to use naloxone. We have trained the Council on Aging. Uh, we have public trainings uh, in the library branches right now. Um, I have one coming up that I'll be doing at the St. Clair Library branch on Friday. Um, I should know what time, but it's not Friday yet, so I'm not positive. Um, but providing this community education, educating on what resources exist, what is treatment and how do I get someone to it? Um, and what is available for someone who wants help? Um, this is just sharing the St. Clair County health card. This is connecting people to the community services coordinating body. This is uh, getting people enrolled with recovery coaching through BW Rock, getting them with District 23 or the Blue Water Chapter, uh, which is our AA and our NA programs. Um, this is connecting people to what's already here. We have it. How do I get them to it? How do I get to start changing uh, the dynamic and the stigma uh, for those who need the services? Um, like I mentioned, naloxone trainings. We, we as an organization this year, and I haven't counted it, have probably given out close to 1,500 kits uh, in this last fiscal year. Um, so probably 1,500 kits that comes out the door of an office of seven people that we have worked to push these. We have done, uh, we did trainings at manufacturers where we got 240 kits out. Um, like I said, Council on Aging, um, because we are seeing an increase in overdose deaths and overdose rates in the 55 plus population, um, which is again, stigma. Uh, older people don't use drugs. Older people are substance abusers. They're not addicts. Yeah, but they still overdose. They mistake a prescription medication on purpose, on accident. They don't know. We're seeing these things happen. So our community education on stigma that, listen, any pill can kill. I think it's one pill can kill uh, is the DEA campaign. Advising folks that counterfeit pills exist, um, where it might not affect me, that one pill you took for back pain might end your back pain forever. Um, so doing these naloxone, these distributions, uh, that is another goal that came out of this. Um, and then data collection. Um, I am that odd guy that, again, I'm in a human services field, but please tell me the numbers. 
Let's see what we can do with them. Um, what's going on? I can guess. We can throw a dart at a board and see if we guess the right thing. Let's get some actual information. So we collected what was known as the Allen Barriers to Treatment. It was a tool designed in the 90s to figure out why women didn't come to treatment. Um, so really taking this look to figure out what stops them. Is it transportation, child care, availability, uh, gender competency? Um, you don't want to talk about it. What's, you know, family stigma? What prevents? Um, secondly, what we saw is the biggest prevention is people don't know where to go. That's it. Most people stated on those that the biggest barrier to entering treatment is they didn't know how to get there. They didn't know where it was. They didn't know what was available. Um, so they didn't know what to access. Um, I can say for self, um, when I first sought to find treatment, I'm old enough and did it long enough ago that I grabbed the yellow pages. And I started flipping through a phone book. Um, today it's Google. Um, but that same kind of part, can we help educate and help people know where to go so they can get there? Um, so Mort had identified these goals. This is what we wanted to work on. Um, the question is, so we first uh, we first went out with PHPD. Our first day of operation for Mort was uh, April 20th, 2021. Um, it was not, it was mostly coincidence, but it wasn't lost on us that, yes, we were starting this program on 420, uh, which is the national, basically, cannabis holiday. Um, so we went out starting in April of 2021. Uh, in that first year, we had 115 total overdoses amongst 98 people. So 98 individuals accounted for 115 identified overdoses. And I, I want to key on some of those words because as Mark Twain says, there's uh, lies, bold-faced lies, and statistics, um, and which one I'm telling right now is the statistics one. Um, that's identified overdoses. That means on the PHPD police report, it was marked as an overdose. If it wasn't marked as an overdose, it didn't get counted. If I didn't call 911 because... I survived it, I used naloxone or whatever, it doesn't get marked. If police didn't go and it was just Tri Hospital or you took them to the emergency department, it doesn't get counted. So while we know that we're seeing a lot of good information, we're seeing a lot of good numbers, we also know that this is a very small portion of what's actually happening. Uh, so in 2021, we had 16 people pass away. Um, that was 16 known fatal overdoses, uh, and that one means they were deceased at the time that a police officer was there. If they died uh, after they left in an ambulance, if they died at the hospital, or a couple of days later, those weren't logged. Um, those are recorded by the county health department and the county medical examiner, um, but we didn't have those numbers specifically, and you know, having the same so. Of the 98 folks, we made contact with 42 of them, um, which was really good. Uh, it's a little bit under 50%. Um, good access, good contact uh, in looking at those. We had 11 people that we drove to treatment. Um, so 11 of those 42, so 25% of folks that we just had a conversation with, we got into treatment. That's 11 folks that weren't entering treatment most likely without that intervention. That's 42 people that didn't know someone cared enough to ask how they're doing. Um, not the world's biggest, broadest numbers, but it's still, these are someone's brother, sister, child, parent, uh, that were given a chance or information on how. Um, then we broke it down to look at what were people using. Um, the high majority was uh, opiates, uh, unknown or other, meaning that the, what the person had taken was not identifiable. Um, sometimes the other, uh, this is the odd ones, we had alcohol. They overdosed on alcohol. Um, for those of you with any clinical experience, you're like, hell no, they didn't. Uh, alcohol doesn't create an overdose that naloxone wakes you up for. Um, so oftentimes it was maybe because of what they told the police, there was a little bit of fake news, um, and they weren't going to tell everything they had used. Uh, in 2021, we had a large number of counterfeit pills. If you talk to anyone who entered recovery in 2021 or was still using, 
and they were an opiate user, you can you can mention the blue or purple pills of the summer of 2021. They will all nod and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they were going through. These were causing a large number of our fatal overdoses. Uh, it was a, someone had brought into our community counterfeit pills. Um, through this more program, we were able to have a conversation that we don't believe they'd have with the police. We were able to get some information from folks who had overdosed through just talking to them. Which, of course, we then relate to law enforcement and go, okay, here's a little more detail. You guys go do the police stuff. We'll keep working with the people that show up. Um, and then this other one. So you're seeing seven stimulants. Cocaine or meth. Again, these are not substances that usually lead to overdose. So this starts to tell us that something's going on. These people were purchasing cocaine or meth, but overdosed. Um, and as we... Uh, we look at this one. So we had just started the naloxone distribution. We got 143 kits out um, in that year. Moving to 2022. So we kind of figured out what the heck we were doing. We got a little better with it. Um, we saw a 10% increase in the number of identified overdoses. We were down to 104. Um, 91 unique individuals. Um, I don't know why that says a 7% decrease because I actually believe... Sorry, I got to like, nope. So seven less folks. All right, never mind. Um, 12 known fatal overdoses. That was a decrease, 15%. Again, 15%. Good. Four people. You know, not the world's biggest number, but these are four people that went home, that woke up, that had tomorrow. Um, direct contact with 44 of the individuals. So we saw an increase in our ability to make contact. 28 people, over half of the people we made contact, we got to some form of treatment. This was showing and completely more effective. It was working. And what we started to see in 2022 is people knew who we were as Mort. Amongst the people who use drugs, Mort was being known. Um, so it was almost, I don't, we, I don't think we were an anticipated our response, but some of the folks who knew who we were and were much more open to talking with us. Some of these folks transported, we had met in 2021. And we were able to continue to have that conversation at either another overdose or just another interaction with them where we got them to treatment. Um, so we saw that decline. Um, things were turning in the right direction. Um, one of the ones you can see with this is it was a little bit less in the opiates, more in the unknown or other. Uh, people weren't certain what was going on. Um, again, we saw this in the alcohol, um, maybe the benzos, um, and some other smaller things. So there was a shift in what was going on in that other section. Uh, pressed pills, and then kind of the same in the cocaine and meth. So still seeing something going on in there. One of the wonderful things we did is in 2022, we distributed 982 in the Loxone. Um, again, not always directly to the person who's using drug. That's not necessarily the person you want it. You want it to the person who knows someone who might use drugs. You want it to the person or the family of someone who's using drugs. You want it to anyone on a prescription opiate. You want it on them because they are at risk. If you take two because it's tough pain day, you have the weather of Michigan and it's fall and chronic pain goes up. Medications go up, and I take extra because I need it today. Um, so we were able to get almost a thousand kits out uh, in 2022. Um, looking into so the first half of this year, so through July, um, through the end of July. So this is really August one. Um, this is the craziest number that we have seen, um, and we even talked amongst ourselves, kind of saying, "What's going on?" 59% decrease from 2022 in that, and that's not for the whole year that I didn't use again, fuzzy math um, and say, well, let's compare six, seven months to 12. No, this is through the same time frame. So January through July, 2022 compared to January, July, 2023, we had 59% fewer overdoses. We had 27. Again, the prior year we had a hundred and over in a whole year's time frame. Um, we've seen a small uptick in the month of August and uh, 
September. Um, but we are still very far behind where we have been. Um, of that only, and we're seeing again, 25 out of 27 of those overdoses was from someone else. It's a weird stat that you want to see, um, but it's showing that this isn't one or two people who are really struggling. This is showing it's a broad problem covering many. So then we start to know that the problem is broader, but we may be starting to see that those who are more frequently overdosing are at less risk for death because they're not making contact with police. Something else is stopping. It could be from a, a stoppage of use. Uh, it could be to the possession of naloxone that's helping them not suffer that fatal overdose. Um, in July, we had two deaths uh, that were identified through uh, Port Huron Police Department. So only two fatal overdoses in that time frame. Um, we're really seeing this shift. Uh, so nine individuals we made contact with, so about a third. Um, part of this, we tend to see what leads to a barrier is those who use drugs don't tend to be really precise with updating their contact information. Um, these are the people that may have multiple residences that they're staying in uh, throughout a year. And each time they don't go down to Secretary of State and wait and put that little sticker on the back of their ID and make sure to update all the people that their address has changed. That's not this population. Um, there are other factors in their life that prevent them from doing some of the, and what a person who is in, not in the midst of use or mental health crisis. It just seemed like the basic things we do. Um, this population doesn't do this. They change the addresses frequently. They change phone numbers frequently. Um, disposable cash is just not a term often used by people who use drugs. Extra money. <laughs> no. Um, so direct contact gets tricky. We're running into individuals who are homeless, um, who don't have a valid address. They were there last week. They're not there anymore. Last known address is a family member's home. So we look at those issues. Um, this year so far, we've brought seven people to treatment. Um, so again, seeing that need still exists. Um, part of our decrease in the number of folks that we have brought uh, is that BW Rock, the Blue Water Recovery and Outreach Center, uh, does uh, is contracted with Region 10 PIHP to provide transportation to treatment for individuals seeking services. Um, so if someone calls access and is needing services and transportation is an issue, BW Rock is a community provider that is able to help with transportation. Um, and I can say, given our staffing, there are very often times where we hope and turn and say, here, try this community resource. If not, call us back. Um, so we're seeing people still getting the treatment. We're still seeing that people are open to accepting it. And we are seeing a significant shift in the number of people who are having an overdose where PD is responding. Um, is that because the naloxone is in home? Likely. Um, is that because people stopped using drugs completely? Possible, probably a little less likely, but I think that's part of it that people are finding treatment and recovery. Um, or is that something else? Um, is that because programs like this are becoming effective? Um, of those 27, what we saw was this shift. So just under half of them are opiates. And when we say opiates, this is your heroin. Uh, heroin is not very common anymore. It is usually a heroin fentanyl mix. Um, oxycodones is a prescription uh, medication, uh, but fentanyl has made its way into most things. Uh, in the last month, we have heard, so anyone following uh, current drug trends has probably heard the word xylazine. Uh, we have had three individuals recently tell us that they are pretty certain that a tranquilizer was in their, uh, what they were using. That would most likely be xylazine. Um, we don't know because we don't drug test. Um, we take word that here's what I thought I used. Um, so we are seeing that fentanyl is still existing. It is still increasing, um, but we're starting to see some other stuff. Um, four on the unknown, just one in the pill section, but 10. Um, we have... 60% less overdoses, but we already have more that believe they were buying meth or cocaine. Um, there was an incident where three three persons bought uh, powder cocaine with the intent to use powder. Uh, they overdosed. Um, in the world of drugs, fentanyl doesn't belong in powder cocaine. It just isn't there. So you have folks that are using cocaine or meth 
that aren't prepared for an overdose. They aren't expecting it, um, but we're seeing that it's it's working in that as well. We had an incident recently where the individual was believed to have bought blood or acid, uh, which would be liquid acid to be put onto the paper, um, and they experienced an overdose. Again, overdose and acid are not generally combined. So this is that weird part where our program, since we're making contact with people who are using is education, how to use safely, how to use a, a fentanyl test script, make sure that what you're using is what you thought. Is your cocaine cocaine? Is your meth meth? Is your heroin heroin? Are you getting something that might just change the desired effect? It might be stronger or it might be something you didn't think you were supposed to use that day. Um, so really shifting a dynamic of um, using smartly. Uh, for those, again, who aren't a personal lived experience, that sounds like any use is dumb use, uh, but sometimes you can intelligently use. Uh, I compare this to when we teach uh, individuals going off to college to make sure that they never leave their drink unattended. Hey, if you get a drink, don't leave it sitting there. Someone could slip something in it. I know you're not 21, but if you're going to go to college, you're going to drink anyway. Do it safely. I don't want sexual assault. I don't want violence. Use alcohol safely. So we'll have that conversation. We're shifting that same kind of use substances safely uh, across the board. Um, make sure you know what you're using. Uh, it's a very common conversation with alcohol. Um, you'll hear it at homecoming season, prom season. I know you're not going to, you know, you're not old enough to drink, but if you do, don't drive. Don't do this. That's the same kind of conversation just shifted towards uh, what is often known as the hard drugs. Um, so far through July, we've got 825 naloxone kits distributed. Um, we have placed 13 naloxone distribution boxes, so that number has gone way up. Um, then it's looking at community resources. So I mentioned that a huge part is education. People don't know where to go. These people have overdosed, and they don't know how to get to the next place. Uh, so one of the things we do with more when we go out with uh, PD, CMH, and ourselves is we'll have a folder, which will have this information in it. Um, this is not a self-serving program. This is not to boost the numbers of individuals who go to Port Huron Flint Odyssey House. Um, this is to help the people who use drugs in St. Clair County find recovery. That's like, that's it. If they go to BW Rock, if they go through Catholic Charities, uh, PCC, Sacred Heart, Meridian Impact, we don't really care. Our goal is to help our community become safer. Our goal is to help our community have less people dying because of some decisions that they made today. Um, so these are a lot of uh, uh, services available. Um, that left-hand side is mostly uh, treatment or counseling or therapy. Um, so ourselves, CMH, Catholic Charities, PCC. Uh, so Odyssey Health, we do have a Flint Residential. We have a Flint Detox. Uh, Sacred Heart and Meridian are two other residential facilities. Um, Impact does a lot of prevention programs um, for parenting, for anger, for drug. Um, a lot of those organizations actually, I think, I think everybody, but maybe Meridian, actually provide services in our jail. Um, then we have our health department. They have our syringe service program, or needle exchange as they're known. Uh, they can get you to education. They can get you to the public health side. Uh, Blue Water Recovery and Outreach Center is a recovery community organization providing coaches. They host a plethora of uh, recovery-based uh, support groups and recovery-based meetings. Um, dry Dock is another safe haven. Uh, it's right there, right there, kind of close to the brass rail. Um, that is a meeting place, meeting room, uh, where it is a safe or sanctuary type place for people in recovery to go uh, and have a place to hang out and find meetings and stay connected. Uh, then you have the traditional 12-step programs of Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. There are also many other groups. Uh, celebrate Recovery, Smart Recovery, Dharma Recovery, um, there is something to help find. So again, a huge part is connecting people to resources that exist. Um, there's recovery housing. Uh, Port Huron Odyssey House uh, has two recovery houses for women and children. Uh, Crossroads Recovery Community, uh, which was previously known as Vision Quest, has changed. 
uh, Crossroads Recovery Community is now providing men's recovery housing uh, in our community. So there was a shift in that provider uh, where it's no longer Vision Quest, but it's Crossroads Recovery Community. Uh, and then, like I said, our cells support here on Odyssey House provide uh, recovery residences. Um, so those are some of the community resources. A huge one I want to hit before we get to questions here is uh, naloxone locations. Um, as I mentioned, we have purchased a large number of what look like newspaper boxes where you would get the auto trader. Uh, if you lived or have visited Las Vegas, the magazines inside those were not auto traders, but something else. Um, we have uh, 34 of those that we've purchased, actually 44. Um, we've placed 14 of them throughout the community at each one of these locations. Um, they are mostly placed either just inside the door or just outside. So if you need naloxone, these are no questions asked. Walk up to it, grab it. City offices for Port Huron and Marysville, Health Department, CMH. Uh, we're going to have a box at every library branch. I think we are up to six of them now. Um, Arbor Impact, uh, BW Rock, as I mentioned, ourselves with Port Huron Odyssey. These are, come up, grab it, no one saw it, carry on. So we don't want to have that stigma. If I have a child that's using, I don't necessarily want to tell somebody that my child is using, but I can get the naloxone and I don't have to talk to someone about it. I can just get it if I need it to put in a first aid kit or to potentially use. Um, then we have local pharmacies. I put an asterisk next to local pharmacies. It's a little bit different now that naloxone became over the counter. Uh, but a local pharmacy might also charge you. I have heard of some pharmacies charging between $10 to $15. Um, any of those other locations, it's free. Um, and we're going to continue to push to get those into places that make it just accessible. Um, so those are resources, naloxone, and a high-level view of our MORE program. Um, if it was wanted or needed, I can share that uh, practice profile. So if we have any other community members that are like, hey, I wanna build this in our county. Uh, I wanna learn how our community can get this. Um, I can share that practice profile on how to build or what are the promising practices for one. Um, the other part would also be uh, if you uh, work in law enforcement or have a partnership that you want to work with law enforcement, you can reach out to Port Huron Odyssey ourselves, um, and we will continue to meet with whatever police chief or public safety folks uh, want to meet with us. Um, so that would be the basics of my presentation. Um, that is my contact info. Um, if you need to email me, you can do so there. Um, I haven't really looked at the chat. I don't know, Christy, if we have a lot. Um, so let me see what we had maybe for questions. Just everyone telling me how great I am. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, I knew it, but it's good to hear you guys corroborate my personal beliefs. We do have a question in the chat. Um, let me just see, back to it. Uh, do you feel or have data um, to to say more is better than having 24-7 ER persons available at our hospitals? So is there data to show that that would be helpful, I guess, is the question? Um, yes. Uh, yes. Placing. So I, I heard you say this EMS staff. The goal is actually to place uh, peer recovery coaches or uh um, addiction professionals on site. Um, like I said, we previously did it where we spent 28 hours with someone at Lake Huron Medical Center. Um, we currently have uh, business agreements with both hospitals, uh, McLaren Port Huron and uh, Lake Huron Medical Center where we're on call. Our staff has badges, has, uh, you know, some of them we have scan keys and we can come on and do a screening at any hospital. Um, the difficulty is we're on call, so kind of on demand. Um, as an organization, we've absolutely sought out funding. Uh, we have applied for a few grants to see if we can make that full time. But having someone in the hospital is an evidence based practice. That project assert we did before uh, has been shown to work. Uh, I've seen a lot of recent articles that say this is a huge way to better intervene. Um, and again, not a knock. Physicians know what physicians know. Nurses know what nurses know. 
Um, it's not their wheelhouse. They don't know it. And that's not because they don't care. It's because they're focused on medical and physical illnesses and bringing in these partnerships of Odyssey House to come in and do our experts engage in the conversation, um, take them from a hospital bed to a treatment facility. Like they exist, do they work? Um, so we don't have 24 seven staff yet, but we are absolutely working at least to get uh, more staff organizationally at these hospitals to take our on demand process now and really make it where that's a person's devoted job. So we're absolutely working on it. Um, Kathleen, I see with the one about any comparison data to see, um, I don't right now. Um, I haven't looked at it to see. So with our QRTs, since we are a state funded uh, grant program, um, we do meet regularly with some of the coordinators and other staff doing these QRTs. Um, so knowing what's in Genesee, Detroit, and those. And I have seen um, at times what we're seeing is the same as theirs, where there's been a downtick. If we see stimulants uprising, so are they. Um, so from what we've seen, it does look pretty similar. I don't know if they've all done or had the same amount of success. Um, but we are seeing that these are working so much so that uh, you know, the state has, so it was originally CDC funded. We're now coming out of the opioid settlement uh, at the state level for another three to five years. So the state was very eager to say, we need to keep these going. Um, it's working. Um, so we are seeing some. If you want to get some of that data, the state will send out a monthly uh, state overdose report for non-fatal overdoses with some information. You can also go to michigan.gov slash opioids, O-P-I-O-D-S. So michigan.gov slash opioids. Uh, scroll down towards the guy with the white hat, click the data button. And there is a dashboard the state has put together that has all the information. If you want to break it by demographic, ER visits. Uh, if you want to compare St. Clair County uh, on some vulnerability indices, um, you can do that if you want to compare zip codes uh, on how much we're more at risk at the 48060 zip code than we are at the 48074 zip code, um, which we are. Um, you can see that we're not great in certain zip codes. That's all at michigan.gov slash opioids. Scroll down a little bit. You'll see that guy. I don't know who he is, but his photo's been up there for four years. Uh, and click that data dashboard button. There's a ton of stuff in there if you are a numbers person. Uh, we do have another question. Would sure. you still recommend that people get trainings for naloxone now that it's um, over, you can purchase it over the counter? Yes. Um, so, and that's a weird part, like to be trained in the administration of naloxone, it's five steps. I could train everyone here. You put the person on their side, you place it into their, you open the package, you put it in their nose, you push the button, you call 911. Done. Um, naloxone administration is that simple. You don't have to have needles. You don't have to do stuff. Um, so the training at that level, yeah, absolutely wonderful. It's in the kit. It comes in the box. Um, what we do with our education, it's a little bit longer. It's more formal. Um, we provide some of those resources and we provide some good education on what's actually going on. It is uh, very informative for the general public um, to learn some of the things. I share some stats on who's overdosing, where it's coming from, risk factors. So it's as much the administration um, it is, as it is just a uh, continuing education piece. Um, but it, it is beneficial. Um, we recommend it in first aid kits. Um, we had a recent death uh, occur at the Marysville Meyer just last Thursday. A uh, person was found deceased there. Um, they didn't necessarily have it on hand. So we're really working to get it all over and just made as common as an AED or a first aid kit. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, someone did ask um, if you could repeat how to get this information. I believe they might be talking about um, the state website you gave. Yep, so the state website is michigan.gov slash 
or birds I can take, you know. <laughs> oh, um, I didn't do that, sorry. You'd have to copy and paste that, which doesn't work well. Let's try that again. Um, that link should take you to the data dashboard for all of that. If you would like to be connected with that practice profile to build one of these, uh, if you're in a community that's looking to start something like this, uh, email me and I can share a copy of that PDF. Um, I don't, I haven't been able to find that practice profile online easily. Um, so it's that. Um, and if you email me through that, then you can also, I can share slides or any other details if wanted. Um, oh, hang on, I did that wrong. Host and panelists, I've said to everyone. Sorry, Fatima, sometimes my tech is not always the best either, so. Uh, that should go out and that should be the link for that Michigan dashboard like it says scroll down to whoever that guy in the hat is I don't know who he is but every time I go there which is like a couple times a week um, that's where there's a little data dashboard and it'll get you to it so um, I appreciate everyone that took time to come out thank you um, just as a reminder, the recovery summit is going on all month with different topics and speakers planned each weekday. Tomorrow's presentation will be at 1 p.m. presented by Dr. Aaron Bonner from U of M on cannabis use and cannabis use disorders, um, the current trends and changing landscapes. To see information and register for additional sessions, please visit sccmh.org under the events tab and recovery summit. Individuals requesting professional credits, you will receive your certificate of accumulated credits by October 30th through email. As a reminder, please complete the short survey at the conclusion of the webinar. We appreciate everyone's feedback. Thank you to our pre presenter, Ken Huvelman. Your time and information is very appreciated. Thank you to all who attended this morning. Have a great day.